Nowadays, it is not unusual for a black woman like Busisiwe Khadebe to be an economist. She's been doing this job for almost 10 years. It's from this desk at Nedbank's headquarters in Santon that she analyzes South Africa's economy and writes reports on how best to get it going again. If we think about how far women have come, and like all women, I'm not just talking about black women, I think all women were actually on the back foot under the apartheid government. If I think of white women, for instance, they were only allowed to have certain jobs or certain jobs were seen as the right jobs for them. So you would be a secretary or sort of a typist at that time. That's the type of thing. I think women are now free to actually, if we just look at Mandela's first cabinet, and we look at something like Fundi, uh, Fundi Jinguala. I mean, I, if I look at that type of things, like women were given the opportunity. I mean, if I think of Mzunzu Lamunuga, women were actually given the opportunity to go out there and actually be on the forefront out there. And I think before they wouldn't have had that opportunity to do it. And I think he opened it up for women. The freedom that Busi has to do what she loves was impossible for black women 25 years ago when South Africa was still in the shackles of the oppressive apartheid state. And I think Mandela sort of and, and his sort of peers just came out there and reminded them that sanity actually needed to prevail. It, is, it shouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that a black girl can grow up and become an economist. Sanity should prevail that I can do that type of thing. And maybe if it carried on longer, I don't think if sort of apartheid would have carried on much longer. You know, if it carried on longer, maybe that possibility would not have been there for me to do it. But I think Mandela has sort of, and his peers, I mean, he wasn't the only one there, but it has sort of paved the way for women like me to think, I can do whatever. The economy that Nelson Mandela inherited in 1994, when he was elected South Africa's first democratic president, was as depressed as some of the people who lived under the apartheid. Many economists watched closely, like Kevin Lings, chief economist at Stanlip. If you go back to the 1980s, uh, South Africa was in a difficult uh, economic environment. Uh, you'll find that uh, we were facing a whole lot of external constraints uh, that included trade sanctions that were quite onerous. We had uh, financial sanctions. South Africa struggled to access foreign capital markets. We had significant foreign exchange controls imposed on South African residents as well as South African companies. Uh, we obviously had a currency that had to be very carefully managed. The reason was the country had very little foreign exchange reserves. So at any point, if South Africa tried to accelerate imports, there was a real risk that we wouldn't be able to afford those imports because we wouldn't have the foreign currency in order to pay for that. South Africa's debt level was starting to rise at a government uh, level. The government of the day was starting to systematically mismanage the finances. And uh, at the end of the 1980s into the early 1990s, uh, government debt rose to 50% of GDP, which at the time was the highest we had ever incurred. Lings has had his eye on South Africa's economy for more than 20 years. Another veteran economist is Azar Jamin. He founded Econometrics, an economic advisory firm in the 1980s. Azar's memories of the tough economy Mandela took over in 1994 are still clear as day. Up until 1994, part of the reason also for the rut that the National Party ended up with was the fact that the government was unable to borrow money from abroad and foreign capital was not coming into the country in a big way. As a consequence, the uh, apartheid government was compelled to keep exporting more than it was importing in order to uh, conserve foreign capital. And uh, that was a very negative uh, uh, strategy because it impelled the government, the apartheid government, to restrict the level of imports. And so the economy was unable to really grow. This pressure from global economic sanctions made the apartheid government surrender political power. But bringing the economy back from the abyss for Mandela was never going to be an easy task, especially as he had to balance business interests with the social needs of the people. Mandela was in a tight uh, ship 
from that point of view, I don't know that he could have done all that much more uh, him, uh, differently. I was involved with uh, the Macroeconomic Research Group, or MERG, prior to 1994, uh, where, which was an attempt by the ANC, under the leadership of Max Sisula at the time, to forge an economic policy for a new South Africa that would get us out of our rut. The trouble is that, that those policies were regarded by the outside world as very investment unfriendly. And so we did not really uh, see the high level of investment that we would have liked to soon after Mandela came in. Instead of what Mandela did was to try and keep a middle of the road path between, if one might broadly term it and crudely call it, the capitalists and the socialists. And uh, that succeeded in improving the economy a fair amount but did not allow us to really achieve our optimal uh, potential. President Mandela inherited therefore a difficult environment but with a lot of challenges to meet. He had a lot of social economic backlogs that he had to address. They were obvious at the time, a lack of housing, a lack of schooling, a lack of uh, health care facilities. For Lings, Mandela's economic legacy included integrating South Africa back into the world economy after many years of isolation. He also restored South Africa's fiscal position by managing bad debt. In the 2000s, I think we started to see the fruits of some of those changes. I think we started to experience a much better outcome in this country and I think people forget that in the 10 years that led up to 2008, ahead of the financial crisis, South Africa's economic growth averaged 4.2%. I think we forget that for four years in a row, South Africa exceeded 4% and at times 5% growth. That in those four years, South Africa attracted, um, created one and a half million jobs in the formal sector that we were able to take our international credit rating all the way up to an A rating by Moody's ahead of the financial crisis. That South Africa was able to lift its foreign exchange reserves to $50 billion, six times the month, six months of import cover. That South Africa was able to uh, start to address s the huge backlogs in terms of access to education, access to housing, access to electricity. And if you look at how many houses were electrified on an annual basis, we're talking hundreds of thousands of houses that suddenly received electricity, that running water was available to a huge number more households, that uh, almost 95% of children could start to attend school. Enormous strides were made. The, the the groundwork for those developments were, were put in place in the 90s and we, and we yielded some of those results in the 2000s. And I would argue that South Africa was on its road to significant prosperity in uh, about 2005, 2006. And I think this country had at that point underestimated just how much change had taken place. Then there was the Growth, Employment and Redistribution Plan. GEAR was intended to grow the economy, create jobs, and redistribute resources like the land to the people. People say GEAR failed, but one of the cornerstones of GEAR was that uh, pay should be linked to productivity. And that was not allowed to actually happen. In, we just had to have extra pay straight away. There was opposition to the idea of bringing down the budget deficit, which actually um, turned out to be far more uh, uh, profitable for the country in the longer term than was ago. And yet we it came under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of uh, uh, opposition at the time. It uh, uh, harked upon uh, investment more in infrastructure, and instead what we've got is a bloated public service rather than more capital investment taking place. Um, those, uh, it harked upon uh, spending more on education and skills development, and that didn't really transpire to the same ex to the extent that we would have liked to have seen. Bussi believes the real fruits of Madiba's economic plan can be seen when looking at the born freeze those who were born after 1994. I did a weird presentation a while back where we looked at silly things like
something like water and how many people have actually t a tap in their home type of thing. Whereas that, I mean, we, we, d we take it for granted, but that wasn't actually the thing that happened back in the day. It was sort of a site and service scheme where the tap would be every 500 meters in the township and you actually went to go get your water there. But those social things that actually happen, those developmental things, I think we take for granted. But a lot of that actually spills into who you are today. If I didn't have that clean running water, I mean, my health outcomes would be bad. I mean, even RDP hours, maybe we haven't done it perfectly. We might not have done it perfectly, but that gave people sort of a home and opportunity. We're trying to redress some of the past. A lot more could be done. I think we've got two, two sort of people looking at this. Some who are saying this is happening too slow, and others who are going, oh my word, we've been punished actually for the past. But I think we just did the best we knew how. Just like his personal legacy, there's much debate about whether Mandela could have made better decisions for the economy. Especially as the challenges South Africa faces today of slow economic growth, high unemployment and high government debt, not to forget junk status, mirror the headwinds of the apartheid state. The big failure of the ANC since 1994 has been in not managing to uplift the skills base and the educational base of the majority of people. If I think about what we could have done differently, so the big thing at the moment is something like land reform and actually this whole thing that people want the land back. And I think it's something we haven't actually spoken, we have spoken about it a lot, but we did nothing over sort of the intervening times from the first time we actually spoke about the land. And it's cropping up and it's cropping up in an ugly way. So I think that's something that should have been taken care of. There was a lot of criticism at the time that the Mandela cabinet and the Mandela administration spent too much time worrying about what foreigners thought, worrying about the IMF's position, credit rating agencies, and trying to adhere to this international norm of what is acceptable economic policy. And so you could have argued that government should have spent more time trying to back then develop a broader infrastructure. So what do these economists think Mandela could have done differently? He did at that time what I think was best. If we think of some of the policies he did, he sort of he, they sort of his government went through, if we think of something like the RDP, we were trying to reconstruct, we were trying to develop, we were trying to build this. And then he looked out also to what is the rest of the world doing? And the things like year came in there. We were busy with trying to get that growth going, which we didn't probably create all those jobs we needed to create. But he was trying to sort of mix match a lot of things to actually fix what was broken at that time. Mandela's economic legacy was one of stabilization and uh, an attempt to rebuild what had been destroyed in the past uh, and I think he was partially successful uh, not entirely successful and it's understandable why he was not entirely successful because some of the diver divergent and opposing uh, factions that he had to contend with could never have allowed him to go in either direction that might have been seen on either side to be the optimal solution. The underperformance of this economy in the last eight years where we've averaged growth of only 2%, that has done a huge amount of damage to this country. The fact that the, the international credit rating was revised all the way from around an A rating into junk status, all of that reflects the fact that government's uh, fiscal position has deteriorated and that all of those all of those uh, fundamentals that we spent so much time putting in place in the, in the 90s and the 2000s that we undermined many of those fundamentals. We changed ministers of finance regular times. Uh, we have struggled to attract foreign investment on an ongoing basis. Uh, so there, there are many things that I think that we've done to lose focus in the last eight years. For most people, Mandela played his part by restoring peace and avoiding a civil war. He is credited for laying the foundation to achieve better social economic rights for the people. It's now up to those who come after him to ensure South Africa's economy becomes a better country for all to live in.